Hey everyone, we're going live with Adam Schluter today, who is a Nat Geo photographer, and uh, you can find his work on Connecting to Happiness. He's going to be joining us to talk about uh, some of the latest events he's participated in and documentaries he's shot, and uh, I know you'll love it. Stay tuned. Hi, Adam. Hey, you. How's it How going? Are you? I am wonderful. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I graduated from college uh, for business in at Mizzou in Missouri. Um, I thought I'd do business. I kind of went through some uh, life stuff. I went through a bad breakup when I was graduating college, and it kind of shifted my whole life upside down. And uh, so I decided to get out of St. Louis. I decided to go to L.A. I was going to do be an agent in L.A. I kind of gave a lot of my life to that, eight months of my life to become an agent. Uh, I got my offer, kind of agent? a talent acquisition agent. I wanted to be Ari Gold, if I, uh -huh. if you've seen Entourage. So that was always kind of my dream, and I thought I'd do that. And then um, I worked just my, I worked my butt off for eight months to get the offer. Then I got the offer, and I was like, I can't live in LA any longer. Like this city just is not my style. It's too, too difficult, too disconnected. And so I left it all behind, and I moved down to Mexico, and I lived in the Baja for about three years, three and a half years. Yeah. And uh, that's when I really started to fall in love with photography. I had always been a traveler, so I was always kind of a travel bum, um, but really like had the, the stillness in my life to just dedicate to photography. So I lived in Mexico for about three and a half years. I got sponsored by a company to travel the whole PCH from the southern tip of Mexico to Alaska and find the best place to live out of all three countries. I went 22,000 miles and I picked Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is a little bit off the PCH, a random story. How'd you uh, get that job? I just thought uh, ridiculous. I just wanted to do it no matter what. So I reached out to outdoor companies and asked them to sponsor me. I was going to do it no matter what, but I wanted someone to uh, just help me out with it, obviously, and uh, kind of be an ambassador for it. So I reached out to Eureka. Uh, I reached out to a bunch of companies, but Eureka actually came back to me and they actually said no. And I was like, you know what? I actually really think this is actually a good fit, a better fit than you guys might think it is. And here's why. And they came back and they're like, all right, you're right. Yeah, okay, we see it from that perspective. What do you think photographers, I'm sure tons of people listening now are like, wait, how can I do that? So what'd you do? You just Googled like a bunch of names and then you found the contacts and then you yeah. emailed, emailed them? If you want things like these to happen, embrace rejection. It is gonna be your best friend in the world. So. Um, don't be afraid to put yourself out there and expect to be rejected. If you get anything else that's like winning the lottery, but as you get those rejections, you can learn a little bit more from them. You really learn learning how to articulate um, and write kind of a passionate, uh, you know, idea, and put it into words and you want to make it, you want to word it to be advantageous for the company. And why, why would they sponsor you right now? They have a million people reaching out to them um, asking for sponsorships, but why are you unique? Why is your style of art, your photography or whatever, why would that benefit the company? So for me, I was a travel and landscape photographer at the time. And so really, I reached out to companies that I uh, thought that their websites were lacking quality pictures. I thought their social media was, it was, you know, it was iPhone pictures, they weren't professional pictures. So I kind of targeted those companies that were in more need rather than a huge company like Patagonia or North Face or something like that. Mm. And then you were like, give me money or what? Yeah, I was, I was just like, you know, sponsor me for this trip. I wanted all their gear. I was, again, going to do it no matter what. So um, I wanted lots of just outdoor gear. I wanted tents. So they send you the gear and they also pay you? It starts as a gear support kind of thing where they send you all the gear that you asked for from their whole lineup. So essentially they want you to use their gear on the trip and you're photographing whatever you're doing with it. And then as you grow in relationship with the company, then uh, it's more marketable um, your work if you can find the relationship and that's when they start to pay you to actually do it. So again, in the beginning, you find some value. In, it's a platform to share your work, a very large platform. It's also good on your resume to say, you know, I'm sponsored by a massive company like Eureka. Um, and you can use that in their gear and that implied value building and reach out to other companies and say hey i'm sponsored by eureka so what would benefit this like you know a, yeah. a gas company or a car company or something like this and do a crazy trip how long does it take you reach out to them they say okay when do you get to start like they send it to you how many weeks does it take 
Yeah, I would say it took uh, maybe a few days. Another thing to really remember is that you really have to be following up a lot. Yeah, again, these companies are very used to people asking for free stuff or sponsorships or whatever it is. So you're going to email it. You're going to check back in five days, send them another, check back in the next week if you don't hear from them. Um, and then once everything rolls, then you start to negotiate kind of the, the terms, kind of negotiate what you have in mind, kind of really convey why you think it's the right fit for them. And then once you solidify it and be for that, then you, you talk about what you're going to get out of it, obviously. And then it, there's a few weeks process where you kind of, with me, it was kind of funny because they gave me their uh, global marketing manager. Um, and he was a very old guy. He was in his like 60s. He was a great guy, but he's very outdated. So I'm trying to negotiate kind of from a millennial perspective, uh, you know, travel and ideas. And I remember he, he would send me these just crazy ideas. And he'd just be like, all right, Adam, I got this idea. You're going to you're gonna be sitting around a fire with a bunch of people and you're drinking red wine and you're, you're eating spinach risotto. And I'm like, dude, Gary, what? Like, no one <laughs> in my age group is eating spinach risotto. Gary. Fire. Gary. 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 Are drinking red wine. <laughs> We're drinking, like, bush beer and uh, eating ramen noodles. So there's a lot of also, like, trying to uh, communicate the vision and then trying to match that. And with this, I just had to say, look, if you want to do this, you have to just trust me because obviously I think that I know what uh, the audience likes and uh, I know what I'm good at doing. So. And you kind of figure all those terms out, and then you you go through, you pick all your gear and everything. And I've done this through with a few big companies now, and uh, it's always a lot of fun. Yeah, and so fast forward me to where you are now. How have things changed? Yeah, so I moved to Coeur d'Alene after that trip. I spent 10 months on the road and 22,000 miles with that constant trip. And uh, moved to Coeur d'Alene, went through some more life stuff. Uh, was hey, I didn't know anyone when I moved to Coeur d'Alene. It was just a Where rant. is that? It's Idaho. Uh, Idaho. Yeah, it's like... We went from Mexico to Idaho? Yeah, from <laughs> total opposites. I wanted, like, uh, somewhere in the middle. So you know St. Louis. It's incredible people, incredible community. It's, yeah. like, uh, very lively. But, again, it's, like... Then you go to L.A., and it's very disconnected. There's no community, and it's, like, work, 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 traffic, whatever. And I wanted somewhere in the middle, because I'm very ambitious. I needed opportunity but I didn't want to be in a place where it was always a struggle or it was always traffic and stuff like that. But Coeur d'Alene was like just a very subjective choice of incredible community, but very entrepreneurial uh, community uh, and great people, small town feel. But for me, I've never been able to sit still. So I'm an hour from Canada, I'm 45 minutes from Montana and I'm 20 minutes from Washington state. I'm a few hours from the ocean. I'm surrounded by all mountains and so it's a perfect spot to just kind of be in the middle of everything but still have a home and try to make some roots but i'm still a travel bum i'm still traveling most of the year can never sit still so i kind of went through all this stuff there i kind of fell into a like a hole kind of like i was you know kind of depressed i was going through some creative ruts and so um, i finally just decided to uh, here's another Time when I reached out to a major company, I asked them to sponsor me on another crazy idea. This time it was Eurail, who runs all the train systems in Europe. And uh, they, I said, I want to do this crazy idea. I'm feeling very alone. I hate social media. I hate that people are so disconnected. I hate phones. I was like, I'm gonna leave my phone at home. I want to fly to Europe, one-way ticket to uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. And I want to ride trains around every country in Europe and just try to introduce myself to people, say hello. And uh, it honestly was just the idea to get beautiful pictures. But then as I would get beautiful pictures, I then wanted to know more about the people. So then it turned into conversations. And as it turned into conversations, I learned so much about vulnerability and authenticity. And as I learned that the rejections went lower and lower and lower, people trusted me and opened up to me so much more. And then it just snowballed into this incredible thing uh, where now it's just, now I go all over the world. It's been in 20 countries um, the last three years, walked up to well over 10,000 strangers to say hello, ask for their photograph. Wow, 10,000? Well over 10,000, yeah, all over the world. I just am constant. I'm spending 15, 16 hours a day just incessantly walking wow. through all these towns and living on trains and moving all the time. And it's like when I'm in my flow is I'm very uh, just, interactive with the world and kind of leaving my comfort zone. 
And uh, you're doing that with or without a sponsorship. You're just interviewing people. Yeah. What what's happening with that content when you? Yeah, so it? that uh, they sponsored that first trip, which was 14 countries in Europe, and that was in two and a half months. And then mm -hmm. came back, and then uh, I got the TED talk with that. Yeah, give people some tips. Like, like they, we're trying to teach the art of the hustle here. I know that so many people are like off their seat, probably just trying to be like, how do I do that? I, I'm like also stuck in a rut. Like, we have tons yes. of artists that are literally feeling the exact same way as you. So, so first thing I would say is make sure that you know what you're the reason that you're you're pursuing art because you're going to have constant you know disappointments when you set expectations there's never going to be a possible expectation you're going to want the ted talk the ted talk's not going to happen you're going to want this it's not going to happen but when you just dedicate yourself to the reason why and for this i just dedicated my life to this i wanted to try to connect the world i wanted to take a strong stance against isolation and suicide rates being so high and that's my passion so i don't really care if we ever get famous or get any a ted talk or anything i was going to do it no matter what but when you pour your heart that much into a passion right. it's always going to work it's just a matter of time um and then you got to really put it out there that's the thing a lot of artists don't like to put their work out there. there's a lot of self-doubt a lot of imposter syndrome very yeah. fair but if you don't put it out there you can't make an impact where do you where do you put it I mean, you start with social media. You start with just putting it on social media. For me, uh, we have one of the best publicists in the world, uh, Tabitha Crack, who's just getting everything on social media because I, I don't. She's do here, it. Tabitha. She is. Yeah, <laughs> she didn't pay me to say that either. She's. <laughs> uh, but to me, I just do it on a website because that's my old-fashioned side. I, I'm not a big fan of the social media, um, but social media is an incredible tool if you use it as a tool to get work out there on a large platform. Um, so. I want to answer your TED Talk question. When I came back, I had all these incredible stories, not about me, but about all the people that I met and the stories that they had shared with me. But I found that, and I make this mistake too, when I would try to tell people these incredible stories, people just interrupted their own stories and people weren't really <laughs> listening and it made it possible. <laughs> what? Is that I'm good at that. Yeah, we all do that. Yeah, and we're excited. It's not always personal, you know, and people yeah. don't know how to relate. They're to just it. trying to relate when you, I feel like when I do it, I'm just trying to relate with the other person. Like, oh yeah, I get what you're saying or whatever. And exactly. I think people need to really keep that in mind. For me, uh, when people do that, I think the right thing to do is to always make sure you circle back to what that person was talking about so we don't detract from them telling yeah. their story. Do and then we get to share our story. That's how we really. So how do you record them? Like, so you, tell me, like, what happens? You go up to a random person. Say well, you know, real quick the... On, the, on the TED talk, I was just trying to share these stories with people, and uh, people would always interrupt their own stories, and it's okay. So someone finally said, "You got to do a TED talk, dude." And I was like, "I don't have a clue how to do a TED talk." So at midnight, I was just sitting there. Someone sent me an application. I filled out the application for TED. And uh, they wanted me to like sum up uh, like these big answers that I had, like in like 150 characters. And I couldn't do it on the application. So I kept saying, uh, asterisk, ask me in person, all caps. And I was, and I just like copy paste, copy paste, like the whole application. I was like, they will never yeah. call me, no way. And they actually yeah. called me to come for an audition. Um, so. That, that's how it happened. I mean, it, it's like you just don't know. But honestly, if you convey your passion, I swear to God, the world will listen and they will hear and just be excited about what you're doing. You know, don't uh, don't you, humility is a beautiful thing. And we need to always manage ego, especially mm -hmm. with art, because the point is never about a spotlight on us. It's a spotlight on why we started a project in the first place. But we also have to be confident enough or even just proud of what we're doing enough to share that with the world. And when you do that, now so few people do that, um, that the world will pay attention, they will hear, and then you can make a bigger world. So how do you get that confidence? Like, where does that come from? Look at, again, the reason why you started this in the first place. For me, I don't look at large audiences or, you know, a million people, subscribe, or anything like that. I look at when I get a note, and it's this little personal note or a letter, or someone orders a book and they say, I'm going to give your your book to my son who I haven't heard from in three months and I'm worried about him and I, I want to real really like try to relate to him and share your message with him and I get a note that says I watched your TED talk and it helped me think of a different way to communicate with my father 
And now we're talking for the first time uh, in, you know, three years. We haven't had a close personal conversation. And it's like, that is true success where it's like, it's not, you're not getting a million dollar book deal. Who gives a crap about that? That might come and who cares about the point. The point is to make an impact and that impact can be so small and you really have to pay attention to that. And if you pay attention to that, how can you not be confident that you make an impact in the world? And I think that's what we're all really trying to do. So do you tell yourself like when something like that happens or like, does it validate for you? Do you repeat it to yourself in your head? Like, okay, like this is, I'm doing the right thing. Like, do you feel like you need that to keep going that external kind of validation? I mean, absolutely. This, you know, uh, pursuing art, this is all I do now. Um, so pursuing art, you have a lot of, you have in, incredible amounts of free time, a lot of time to think, a lot of time to be in your head. Uh, you're you're going to have just constant rejection, lots of failure. So you have to balance that out with optimism. I mean, how crazy do you have to be to get told no for three years in a row and still keep fighting yeah. for something? It's like, you have to really believe and have that purpose. Once you, you know what your purpose is, you just can't stop. Um, and that, I think that's, I don't know if that's confidence more than, it is confidence, but it's really just being proud. And I think if we were all, if we all gave ourselves a chance to be more proud of what we're doing, no matter what it is, it could be someone that's cleaning a hotel room or, you know, raising a child or whatever it is, the world would just be a lot more optimistic of a place because we would, really relish in other people being grateful for the things that they're doing. Wow, yeah, I mean, I I think also to the whole business side of things and getting and sustaining your life and growing that is like really difficult in also trying to pursue your art. So for you, it seems like you got someone to help you with that. Is that right? Absolutely, I have. So my sister has been my best friend and my number one supporter through the very first day of this. Um, her and her husband, Andrew, have always been longtime supporters of this. I mean, with no one else. I remember she was the first person to buy my book um, and no one else had a clue what was going on. And now we just grew from this team. Uh, and now we have an incredible team of Brandon, Andrew, Bethany, Tabitha, and uh, we're continuing to grow with this, but I'm nothing without a team around me. And I think all of us artists also try to do everything ourselves. We try to keep it all ourselves. It's hard for us to ask for help. And a lot of times that's when that humility can get in the way. But as soon as I started to ask for help and grow a team around me, I was like, why didn't I do this years ago? I mean, dear God. Uh, and so- like You started with your family, right? Like obviously you're not paying them. They love you. They're trying to help you out. So yep. how, do you, how do you delegate to them? How do you tell them what you need? That's hard. Yeah, because I, I, again, I always, I've always done this on like, you know, the very, very, very beginning. And then I don't always know what I need. And so it's really collaborating. And then right now when we're continuing to add to the team, it's like you have to see the vision in this and believe in this every bit as much as we do. Because I can't tell you why you should care. I can't tell you why this is important, but it's incredible if we truly believe in it. Um, so right now delegating is like, you know, sharing, okay, I got this footage. I was just in this is incredible story I got. And then the team can see a different perspective of that. And then they can kind of shift it around. So I think it's just a learning process. I'm very, it's very strange to be delegating and managing multiple people. Um, I also have to be motivating and inspiring. And, you know, again, this is uh, a team that's really sacrificing a lot of time and hard work to help the overall goal. Um, but when everyone believes in the goal and the vision and they know that uh, we're really making an impact in the world, they can help assist that in every way possible. But I'm learning as I go. Never done this before. So, yeah, a lot of people too. So if I'm, say, like a 20-year-old photographer in, I don't, like, let's say Chile or, or India or Spain, and I have, like, a family member or a, fr a close friend that – believes in me like how can i have them help me like i know how to like do my art but what is what do they need to do to help you like them in this in the beginning is it reaching out to businesses that you feel like align with them or how can they help them get projects well first i would make sure that their attributes are something that benefits you you know um i think at the bare minimum we need people to share in our artistic journeys and endeavors because 
They are really freaking hard. They're really difficult. They're really emotionally intensive. They're really disheartening sometimes. And so at, at minimum, they have that family just say, hey, keep me grounded. Hey, make sure that I'm okay. Make sure that I'm spending time with you and we're having dinners and we're talking about other things. But we're also like, you know, uh, really like talking about dreams and ideas and optimism together. Um, but if they have a strong attribute, like uh, my brother-in-law, Andrew Jansen, is a fantastic editor. And it's like, I don't, I've never edited a video in my entire life. So it's like, can you, t I'm, I'm out here getting all this footage, but I really know how to put it together. So can you put something together? And then he, he does. And then I say, okay, but let's just change this about it to give this feel. And then I get a better idea. And then the next time I'm getting the, the video in person, I already have that in mind, how to put it together. And then we kind of all collaborate with that. So I think it's using each person's individual attributes to the best of their ability to assist you in the things that you are not as good at. Because again, we try to do everything on our own, but then it takes, for me, it's like the best thing that I can be doing is being on the street, being out in the world, traveling and just getting all this beautiful content and making all these impacts. And so if I then try to do that, and then I try to be the publicist, and then I try to edit video, it's like, it's just too much. And you get overwhelmed. Yeah. And when you're overwhelmed, you don't create anything at all. So asking for help is the first step. And how long do you think it takes doing that until people notice you? Like you could be creating so much content, putting it out there and nobody even look at you. You could do it forever. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing for you to do is to put your work out there and then let go of any expectations with that. If you know it's good or if you like what you did, right, let's not even say good. Don't pay attention to uh you know all the likes or the whatever the comments even on that because art is so subjective that's not the point but i would also listen and read and pay attention to those things because people are also educating you your audience is always helping you continue to evolve and grow and they'll pull something out let's say i put a story and someone say you have no idea how much that means because i'm going through the very same thing and then it's rather than random chaos of like oh i'm just getting whatever stories it's like Maybe I should really focus on these kind of questions with asking people to help empathize and help people relate to these things. So the only way to continue refining your vision and refining kind of where your path should be going is to put it out there in the world, collaborate with other people, get out of just your own head the whole time. Because um, again, that can be ego too, where it's like, no, I'm only going this direction. But art is just a maze and it's just wandering and and you're always moving forward, even if you're wandering, but at least you're moving forward, you can also be learning as you go. So I, it's, a, it's an impossible thing. Some people go viral and they're famous overnight. Um, they say it takes 10 years to make an overnight success. And I think that's the truth. And it's like, again, reminding yourself the reason you started allows you to keep fighting in the hardest moments. And if you have that purpose mm -hmm. and your, per your, your expertise, you're also learning to be better at the craft as you continue to practice. And as those two things grow together, it's not a matter of if you'll make it, it's just when you'll make it, as long as you don't give up. But you're gonna you're gonna want to give up a thousand times, I promise you. So just don't give up. Ten thousand maybe. <laughs> yeah, ten thousand maybe, yeah. Remember the goal, that's it. And you'll keep going. That's amazing, Adam. Well where can people find you? So the website is hello from a stranger dot com. Um, that is everything on it, the TED Talk on it. Uh, and then on YouTube, it's Lightcast Media. Um, and we have a lot of incredible coverage. I covered all the protests in America the last four months. I did one of the most iconic uh, coverage of COVID in America, uh, finding connection during COVID. And then a lot of the Hello from a Stranger uh, project uh, is continuing to be released on YouTube every single week as we're doing a web series. And then we're pitching as a show now and hope hopefully make this into an Anthony Bourdain style show. What about the book? Where is that? Yeah, and the book's on the website too. Um, that's hellofromastranger.com slash order the book, but it's also just under the book page on it. And uh, right now, up until December 31st to, right now, a lot of people are really isolated. A lot of people are really separated from family and really struggling. And so I'm doing buy one, get one free book so that everyone that orders a book, it's a second one to give away to someone that might be struggling or might be feeling alone. And it's a way to just say, hey, I see you. I care about you. I love you. I'm thinking about you. And all these stories in the book, these are all complete strangers before I walked up 
to them. And these stories are incredible in the moments that unfolded. So also reminding people that are feeling isolated that the world is still there, that people still love you and people still want to hear from you and you still connect and just reach out and ask for help when you need to. That's amazing, Adam. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this time. I really appreciate you helping put a spot.